Hi, I'm Shelby with Education Elements. I'm a former teacher who became a policy researcher who became a consultant. And this means that so much of the guidance that I provide school district leaders and school leaders is grounded in my belief that data play a powerful role in the decisions that we make every day as leaders, and therefore in the educational experiences of students and their families. In this video, I'm going to challenge you to think differently about the data that you are using right now, and maybe the data you're not using right now, and how that information can be used to support teachers through various learning models. I'd like to start with a story about the Space Shuttle Challenger, which I've only recently began to learn more about that catastrophic event that happened back in 1986. If you're familiar with this event, this is when the Space Shuttle broke apart about a minute after launching and all seven crew members uh, did not survive, including Krista McAuliffe, who would have been the first school teacher in space. It was a terrible event, certainly something that NASA has spent a lot of time studying and working hard not to repeat. But there is a new Netflix special uh, that I recently watched that focuses on the more human side of this event. Of course, the stories behind each of the crew members, but also the human factors that led to that really terrible event. And if you're familiar with the reasons why it occurred, then you know the term O-ring and you know that that was the specific part of the solid rocket booster, which are the two things on the side of the space shuttle that get it into orbit. The O-rings on those boosters are what failed. What I did not know until watching this special, this documentary, is that there was actually a lot of information available to NASA and to the manufacturers of these O-rings to lead them to believe that this might not work and that it might not be a successful launch. For one, every successful launch they had had prior to that one using these solid rocket boosters, they had studied the boosters whenever they came back down to Earth and actually found damage in those O-rings every single time. So there's a lot of evidence that something was happening during launch that was causing damage to those O-rings and the manufacturer was in the process of still studying and trying to figure out why they were, were being damaged and there was some concern that at some point they could completely fail. The other interesting thing about that day is that it was a colder day than any other launch that they had done previously by more than 20 degrees. There was actually a few people at the manufacturer of the um, solid rocket booster part who voiced concern over that temperature and said that they had not tested their rocket boosters in that temperature before and actually were specifically worried about the O-rings. And so what happened that day is, you know, that information was presented to the people who made the decision of whether or not to launch. But those individuals had a bias that I think that they did not acknowledge and when they made the decision of what information to prioritize and what information to, to disregard. And their bias was that they really wanted to launch that day. It had been delayed for multiple days. They had you know, a president and um, politicians and a lot of funders who were really pressuring them to get this going. And that bias led them to make Make decisions about what information mattered and what information didn't. And unfortunately on that day, the information that they disregarded had a fatal outcome for those astronauts. In education, we make choices about our data too. We decide the kinds of information that are most important and that we're going to use when we make decisions. And we decide which information is less important. And look, as a researcher, I completely believe in the power of that information and that we should be using it to drive our behavior. Behavior. I think the mistake that we make sometimes though is that we fail to recognize our bias and how we make those decisions based on those biases and not acknowledging them kind of makes us blind to uh, the trade-offs that we're making and the information that we're disregarding and what that means for the decisions that we make. A great example I think right now is that our teachers are instructing in a very different world right now and are using completely different tools, different strategies, different models than they have ever used before. But there is a tendency, I think, to still rely on and depend on the data sources and the information that are most comfortable for us. We know what testing data is. We know what attendance data is and the way to say like this student is present and this one is not. But we now are in this world where we have all this additional information. 
such as technology usage data or engagement data. There's something to be said for perception data, for what kids can tell us about their own experience and what teachers can tell us about how they feel like it's going and honestly families and their experiences as well. I think if we don't evolve in the way that we collect and use information, then we're limiting the impact that these innovative learning models can have on our students and that we're failing to set our teachers up for success if we can't fully inform them on what is working and what isn't. At Education Elements, we have identified six essential components of a strong data culture. One of these is holistic, which requires leaders to take a comprehensive view of all of the information available to them and make really intentional decisions about the information that they are going to prioritize. This requires really identifying and neutralizing any biases that might inform those decisions and in turn the behavior that results from those decisions. We believe that is best done through socialization. So here are three steps for leading your team through this process. First, perceptions are based on both your preferences, things that you lean into, as well as your ambivalence, things where areas where you don't have a preference. So have your team reflect individually on both areas where they have preferences and areas where they have ambivalence, and then have them share out with the team and discuss how these collective preferences might shape your perceptions as a team or as a group. Next, design at the margins. Look at those collective perceptions across your team and identify what perspectives might be missing and what information do you have available to you that you can use to fill those gaps or what kind of new information do you need to collect? Think about how that relates to the current decisions that you make about the information you decide to use to inform your decisions or drive behavior versus those that you decide to not use and how you might need to adjust those decisions going forward. Finally, put your end user in the center of your focus and think about what information they need in order to be successful. And how should that change how you think about the information you collect and use going forward? I think if the, if the challenger team would have identified their biases and thought more holistically about the information that they were using that fateful day in 1986, I think they would have acknowledged how the choices they were making in their uh, information usage did not ultimately serve the people who had to make that really important decision about whether or not to launch that day. Similarly, I think if we acknowledge the bias that we have towards the comfortable and the familiar when it comes to collecting and using data and identify what perspectives might be missing from that conversation. And then you put teachers and students in the front of our focus as the end user of that information. I think it opens up all new possibilities about how we think about supporting teachers through implementing these new innovative, flexible learning models. You know, imagine a scenario where teachers are using student feedback or student perception data every day to make decisions about the kinds of instruction that they provide, the content that they cover, the format that they use to share that information, or a dashboard that they have access to that goes beyond just attendance data from a, is a student present on a Zoom with their camera off, and more so gives them a snapshot of data around the length of time they spent in specific platforms, the number of times they revisited content before they answered a question, or their level of engagement in um, a really intricate way to inform, give a teacher an idea of where a student is coming from whenever they start their day. So my challenge to you is to take this back to your team and have this conversation. Identify your biases and your perspectives and how that is driving the decisions you're making about what information to use of what information to not use. And I think we can get you started on that conversation today with a pause and reflect question. I'd love for you to take a few minutes and brainstorm a list of new information available to you that might not have been available pre-COVID. Uh, take some time to brainstorm that list and hopefully that can be a jumping off point for you when you have this conversation with your team. As a quick recap, we talked about the choices we make about the information that we use and the information that we don't use and how that impacts our decisions and ultimately drives behavior. I hope that this inspires some new ideas for you and your team about how you can continue to support your teachers through implementing new, innovative, flexible learning models. 
Thanks so much for watching. For more information from Education Elements, be sure to check out our website and follow us on Twitter.